Well, thank you very much. And um, I would like to say at the outset that uh, Garrett was going to give me dinner before I gave this speech or afterwards, I've forgotten which. And he's a huge loss to your country and he's a huge loss to those of us who loved him. Uh, and I had a hell of a lot of disagreements with him. It never made one jot or tittle difference to a, a deep and abiding friendship. And I, uh, we're all the losers for him. But he is also a model that you can be a nice guy in politics and also straight. <laughs> now, constrained intervention is what a term that I came up for trying to describe what happened at Lib in Libya. And I think Libya is going to prove to be very important. But I'd like to start, if I might, at the beginning. In the search for unifying themes in the 21st century for the UN, some urge the primacy of security, others the primacy of democracy, despite democracy not being mentioned in the UN Charter. Others believe that there can be no lasting security or democracy without the underpinning of human rights. Human rights, in my view, and I've held this for a long time, I wrote a book about human rights when I was Foreign Secretary, is not just an add-on, but it's something that has been striven for in the United Nations from the start. It is worth reminding ourselves that while the war was still waging, the big four met at the Dumbarton Oaks Conference of 1944 to plan for a post-war world. It's also quite important for the British to remember that it was the US which insisted on a reference to a universal declaration of human rights against British objections and Soviet objections. On the 25th of April 1945 at San Francisco, the founding conference of the UN started and soon the UN's US Secretary of State, Edward Stettinius, made clear that the US expected a human rights commission to be established to promptly undertake to prepare an international bill of rights and the eventual full UN Commission on Human Rights met in January 1947 at Lake Success in New York State with Eleanor Roosevelt in the chair. Now, it is because of that deep and underlying thing on human rights, it's ensconced in the UN family. The extension of democracy is a welcome development for most of us, member states of the UN. But we must not forget, and that it's recent, you know. I mean, when I was in the late 70s, China abstained on practically all discussions in the UN. China's becoming ever more involved in the UN and more active. But here they are with the largest population of any member state. They don't accept democracy in as an essential aspect of human rights, let alone a contributor to progress in the widest economic and cultural sense. And there are a considerable number of other countries in the UN that don't take this. So I don't think we can put democracy at the core, at the center of the 21st century uh, UN development. It can be there as uh, part of our aspiration. And it is, I think, very interesting how certainly almost all my active life in foreign affairs the prevailing view within the British Foreign Office was that democracy would never come to the Arab states. And indeed, the Arabists used to lecture us that there was something special, unique, and almost peculiar in a, in a virtuous way about Arab people not wanting democracy. Well, that looks pretty different now, and I think it was always nonsense. So it's a, it's a good moment to look again at this balance between human rights and democracy. I don't think you always have to choose. Now, of course, all politicians always believe it's much better not to have to choose. But I think it is perfectly reasonable, given human nature and the difference of circumstances, and the Arab Spring is a very good demonstration of this, that you pursue human rights and you pursue democracy. And as the situation evolves, one or the other seems to strike a great accord with the country, and you push that one. <laughs> and sometimes neither strikes a record. Or you can move on both fronts. At the moment, for example, I think that it's um, pretty inevitable that you're going to have to give human rights a much higher priority than we have given hitherto in Iran. And I welcome that. Now, I know I'm speaking in Dublin. Bahrain is a, a, a live issue here. I followed it very carefully. I think the delegation which Owen O'Brien took uh, to uh, Bahrain 
and with politicians, a mixed delegation, doctors, politicians, human rights workers, was a very, very fine example of you, um, if you like, using the friendship that had been developed through the medical training in Dublin and the links into Bahrain. Owen is a friend of mine, so I'm not objective, uh, but I, nevertheless, I, the report of their findings, which occurred in the uh, Lancet uh, early in September, is a model of that sort of report, and I think it's extremely important that that pressure on Bahrain comes from a country like Ireland, with this unique link located into the whole heart of medicine, and I think it is outrageous, some of the things that have been done, and it's worth pursuing and persisting in pressure in this particular area. Now, the UN Charter, I think, has withstood the passage of the years surprisingly well. Uh, there was a time when it was always in my hip pocket, and that was in the Balkans. And um, I got quite fond of it, actually. And I think it is more flexible than people have thought. It still, in a funny way, reflects the realities of the power structures of 1945, not completely by any means, but its capacity to switch from Shanghai Shet to Communist China, to accept the breakup of the Russian Federation, and not to take the opportunity to ditch Russia, which I think owed a lot to Bush Sr.'s uh, diplomacy, and very wise and very careful. And one has to go back to Anthony Eden's quiet, persistent readiness to have serious rows with both Roosevelt and with Churchill and his championship of France's continued positioning in international affairs after the war. And never given very much credit for it, but I believe one of the great achievements of Anthony Eden as Foreign Secretary. Yet the UN cannot be static into the 21st century. We all know it. Reform has to take place. I'm not going to go into all the arguments. We all know them, but it is ridiculous that India, Japan, Brazil, Germany, and a African country, perhaps are on rotation, is not reflected permanently into the UN. And now that people have got used to the fact that there will be five countries still with a veto, but the others will be permanent members, but without the veto, I think we've already reached a stage where it would be almost impossible for Britain to exercise a veto on its own without having at least one other member, and that's basically more likely not to be France. And it is very interesting how, despite, and I'm a great believer in Anglo-French cooperation, and I saw it in the Balkans working extremely well, too. Um, in the UN context, French-British cooperation, with the exception of the Iraq war, but then I think a lot of the fault there lay in London, not in Paris, uh, has been really very good and continues to be. I know some of you in this room, because I know some of your positions of old over Europe, will be believing that there should be a European representation uh, in the UN. Well, I hope you won't go on with this absurd <coughs> nonsense. I mean, here we are. We've just lived through Libya with Germany unable to support and Poland unable to support us and France and Britain left with uh, uh, carrying largely the can over Libya. Don't go on telling us that the moment is ripe for UN representation to be by uh, Catherine Ashton and, the, uh, Ashton and that. This is absurd, and really Europe makes itself absurd when it goes for pretension. Be realistic. Maybe it'll happen. Who knows? I don't know the future. What my grandchildren are going to live up to, I don't know. But I'm by training, as you said kindly, a doctor of medicine, and medicine is about evolution of human uh, conditions, and that applies to politics. And we are not allowing our people to catch up with our European pretensions. Just let them catch up, and then we'll have some of these uh, other ideas. Now, I want to look at the future. But you can't look at the future without just a very quick look back. And I think that last 50 years, I think the most dangerous for the world, but in a funny way, probably the most stable. And so we may look back forward and see a, a more stable uh, 50 years than we've, uh, sorry, a more dangerous if in some respects, but less stable uh, 50 years. There was an element of stability in the Cold War, but extreme danger. And people do forget this. 
and a lot of pretentious nonsense is talked about. I mean, you know, our cities were targeted. There was minutes. Uh, the world, when we now learn more about the Cuban Missile Crisis, you know, there was a missile with a nuclear warhead 15 miles outside the Guantanamo Bay that on one Friday night was capable of firing on an invasion from the United States without reference back to the Kremlin. We don't get very much closer to world war than that. So we have lived through very dangerous times. But still, we have a structured international world. And I think we can learn a great deal from that world and now look forward. I think the crucial moment was 1990 and the invasion of Kuwait. And for a moment, George Bush Sr. bestrode the world, having assembled that multilateral coalition. And it looked extremely promising. And we talked, a lot of us, not only idealists, about a new world order. And having assembled a force which included Egypt, Syria, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia, it did seem possible to believe in almost anything. And there used to be learned articles suddenly produced about the reinstatement of the military staff committee, the first casualty of the Cold War on the UN Charter. Something I'd love to see, but anyhow, that was a dream that lasted about 18 months. Nevertheless, it is worth analyzing. Uh, I'm not going to do it at great depth, but that 1991 period. I'm not one of those who think it was a mistake not to go into Baghdad. That was a decision taken after a good deal of thought and care, both in London and in Washington. And they made the correct judgment that if they did that, it was outside the mandate, which was connected with Kuwait. It would have caused great feeling in the multilateral, and almost certainly the Arab countries would have withdrawn. They might have been successful, who knows? Certainly they were in a position to be successful. But I draw another conclusion from that. I think where it all went wrong was on the ceasefire. And I think we need to look very carefully at ceasefires again. You may remember that ceasefire was imposed without a lot of forethought. It was a hugely emotional moment. The uh, Iraqi forces were on the road back uh, from Kuwait, and it was called a turkey shoot. And the pictures on television were horrendous, really, with no uh, air power at all. US and Allied forces were coming in and sort of shooting at these convoys of escaping Iraqi forces. My mother rang me up and told me that, David, you've got to do something about this. I said, well, she was 88, 89 at the time. I said, I, I have an open power about this, she said. Anyhow, five minutes later, um, Colin Powell announced there was a ceasefire, and my mother rang up and said, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> <laughs> I lived off that until she died <laughs> in age of 92. But it was a horrendous moment. But it, if you think of it, it all comes back that you can't look at the 2003 war without realizing that we failed to implement the ceasefires that were agreed. The ceasefires were not brought through. Because the ceasefires were not through, we had to go in with Operation Comfort and stop the Kurds being taken out. I still think one of the best of the post-war um, uh, interventions owed a lot to both uh, John Major as Prime Minister and uh, President Mitterrand. Uh, Bush Senior was very reluctant to do anything to delay bringing the troops back before the election, which he looked almost certain to win. But there we are, and I think it's uh, worth giving some thought to this. I think uh, unconditional surrender, which got a bad name after 1945, is nevertheless, uh, at the end of a just war, sometimes a necessary requirement. And dealing with a person like uh, Saddam Hussein I think it was probably a necessary requirement, or if not unconditional surrender, a very clearly agreed ceasefire demands and uh, provisions should have been built in right from day one into the Kuwait operation. It wasn't. We paid a huge price for it. But if anybody thought, and I who wrote a passionate letter, which was front page on the Evening Standard to John Major to use uh, a no-fly zone, 
1991. If you told me that that would have still been operating in 2003, I'd have said you're joking. And I think there is far, far too much glib talk about uh, how uh, Saddam Hussein was contained. In my view, he was not contained. Quite apart from anything else, he did actually develop uh, weapons of mass destruction, and uh, that was proven by the inspectors in that early period. Now, I'm not here to justify my support for the Iraq war, which was clearly wrong anyhow. So uh, I think the, you make a judgment about going to war, and you have to decide, will you do more harm than good? And you try and assess also the good that you do. Far, far too much uh, damage was done to civilians in Iraq for anybody to be able to stand up and say this is a just war or that it was justified. And it was, as we now know, absolutely appallingly conducted, predominantly from the president's office in uh, number 10 Downing Street and in Washington. And we must learn lessons and never allow this to happen again as far as the UK is concerned. We had the complete absence of cabinet government virtually from 1997 until the coalition took place in Britain in 2011. It improved a bit under Gordon Brown, but not a lot. And we now have the restoration of cabinet government and long may it continue. But there were many, many things which are beginning to come out, and hopefully will come out even more with the Iraq inquiry, but already in virtue of the evidence about how not to conduct a war. And it is interesting that those lessons seem to have been learnt perhaps more in America than elsewhere. I'm not going to touch on the um, involvement in Bosnia. We can discuss this in le letters and things like that. But having established no-fly zones effectiveness, in 1991, I was passionately a believer that we had to use air power to tilt the balance of war against the Serbs. And within the limits of being told before I was appointed, although I'd advocated it before I was appointed, by both uh, John Major and President Mitterrand that they would not consider it unless the United States were involved. And since it became perfectly clear the United States were not going to be involved, there were limits to how much I could argue that case. But I do think Libya, and I'll deal with Libya soon now, uh, is another demonstration that you can tilt the balance of forces of those who are fighting on the ground by an intervention from the air from other states without putting your forces in on the ground as an occupying force. That is the lesson, the lesson certainly of Libya, and in part the lesson of Operation Comfort and Protection of the Kurds. But we were on the ground in the region at the time, so it's got to be a bit careful about that. We weren't, I don't, by any standards, an occupying force. But I think that it, there are very serious lessons for um, uh, Bosnia over this. In 1991, as part of the belief that the world was changing and that Boutros Ghali was given a good deal of freedom by uh, the Security Council to be a very activist uh, Secretary of State, uh, uh, Secretary General, not quite Hammershell type, but really quite clear, uh, right, really quite considerable. There were a huge number of interventions at the time, not just in um, uh, Bosnia. But the, it all really went wrong when I think Boutros which given what happened to him and the Americans turned against him, actually allowed the Americans far too great a control of the operation in Somalia. I mean, it was the uh, ranger being towed behind this truck through the streets of Mogadishu that had a lasting effect on American public opinion, meant that Clinton uh, completely changed his commitment, really, um, internationally. And it undoubtedly laid the seeds of Rwanda and it certainly laid the seeds for the failure for the US to engage in uh, the Balkans until after the Srebrenica genocide. So it's a hell of an expensive proposition. And we need to look back at Somalia. And actually, my criticism of Boutros and Inez is, is, is that he was too, he allowed the Americans to run the operation under the UN flag. But as soon as it went wrong, it was the UN that had done the harm. Of course, that is the role of the UN quite frequently, to go when other nation states uh, are fear to go. And then when things go wrong, take the uh, buck as the heads of state pour the shit on them. But then that's life. And it's a very useful organization to have around. And you must accept that. And 
these, you know, international negotiations are disposable. Now let's deal with Kosovo, which is a very interesting intervention. First of all, this undoubtedly stretched the uh, UN Charter, the elastic of the UN Charter. I used to say to breaking point, but I, my friend Robert Skidelsky argued we actually broke it. Um, I think we were right to do it anyhow. We were in an unusual situation, a very unstable situation with one of the parliament members. Yeltsin, in effect, said, do it but don't come to the United Nations. If you come to the United Nations, I will feel bound to veto it. So just get on with it and I won't stop you. I won't interfere. That was broadly the deal. And Bill Clinton, you know, had great skills. And one of his was that his uh, stepfather was uh, an alcoholic. And when the history comes to be said of how he handled Yeltsin, it is an extraordinary good example, helped, I believe, by um, Strobe Talbot, Immensely. Anyhow, with that reality, I think the action we took was what we wanted. Now, it has to be told, you know, the, the president of the United States was told by military and diplomatic people that a couple of two days, two or three at the most, and the service would fold. Well, 85 days later, the bombing was still going on. And the, I, I wanted to, to develop this just a little bit because there is such a huge misunderstanding what happened in Kosovo. A US Air Force review showed that only 14 Serb tanks were destroyed, not 120 as initially reported. 18 Serb armored personnel carriers were destroyed, not 220. And 20 mobile artillery eliminated, not 450. The Serbs constructed fake artillery from logs and old truck axles and surface-to-air missiles made of paper. And it is still in Western capital after Western capital and in universities studying foreign affairs up and down the world, I keep getting shunted back at me this brilliant NATO military operation that brought the end of Milosevic. And it's, now, I was in favor of using force. It was certainly a factor but this did not bring an end to the war. The Serb military believed that they had held on in Kosovo and they were not defeated. Milosevic lost power ultimately because he eventually was forced to order the Serbs out of Kosovo with extreme reluctance. And that was why General Jackson very wisely did not follow the Sacker's demands to go into um, uh, Pristina Airport, because if he had done, he would have broken the transition agreements, and the Serbs would probably not have gone out. I mean, it would have been utterly a chaotic arrangement. But what is important to remember is that the famous meeting with Chernomerdin and Artishari, at which Milosevic uh, agreed to the terms, was preceded by, I think a fortnight earlier, Chernomerdin went into Belgrade. Now, nobody knows what happened, but remember, these were the days when the uh, Soviet leaders didn't boast about Gazprom, and they always said that Gazprom acted commercially, which of course is nonsense, and that Gazprom would not interfere with pipelines or do anything of this sort. My own belief, and nobody, I've never yet spoken to anybody, even Strobe Talbot doesn't come, uh, if he knows, he doesn't come absolutely straight out with it, but I believe that something was said by Chernomerdin to Milosevic, who gave him no other option, and I think Chernomerdin reminded him that he had been the chairman of Gazprom and he knew where the taps were on the pipelines and there would be no more gas if uh, he didn't agree to this. But extreme pressure was put on by Russia. And that was, if you like, a payback for uh, all that Clinton had done to help because Clinton did not want to put troops on the ground. But Tony Blair to this day, and you've really got to read his autobiography and any other thing, believes that it was all the threat to go in on force that made the difference. All of these things are cumulative, but this was predominantly, I would say, a diplomatic success, ending this long uh, and rather tortured uh, battle. Now, it's important to remember that, because we must not exaggerate, and we must certainly not, post-Libya, exaggerate the use of air power. And we were in many ways lucky in uh, Libya. Now, let me come to Libya. Um, I'm proud of the fact that for a few weeks I seem to be the only person arguing for a no-fly zone. You may not have noticed me doing it because one of the reasons is the only um, uh, 
place where I used to put myself forward to speak was Al Jazeera's. And I, I, I didn't bother about the BBC. If the BBC wanted to do something, that was fine. But my hope was that we had to make people understand what a no-fly zone could do in the Arab world. And it was not until they really did begin to understand, and the French did a lot of education of what was the potential for it, that we stood a chance of getting a resolution through the Security Council. The first lesson then on constrained intervention is it has to be in future in the UN context. Unilateral action like in Iraq in 2003 and, Iraq and Kosovo before, I just don't think will be done. Whether it should or shouldn't, we can leave that argument aside. I just don't think politicians will do it. After those failures, you have to, or, uh, well, Iraq is definitely a failure. Kosovo is not a failure, but there are lessons from Kosovo. So we have to be very careful. The Arab League's championing of this was crucially important and swung or put the Russians into a situation where they could really, they, they had to choose, and it was difficult to go against the Arab League. I think there was also some very successful diplomacy by France and by Britain. I think it's done a lot to restore confidence in the Foreign Office, which was at a hugely low ebb, that they took this resolution, ran with it, and did the necessary lobbying, and we did get the right votes, and it's extraordinary, no country voted against uh, abstain, abstentions, but of course no veto. Now I look on that as again part of the constrained pattern of intervention. It will be very rare, if not uh, never, that interventions will take place in the uh, opposition of the powers surrounding the area you're going to intervene. I also think it will be pretty necessary to rule out occupying forces I don't say again it won't be possible to do it, but it, it'll be quite some time before you could ever get UN support for the sort of military operation that was conducted by President Bush in the spring of 1991. And that might mean standing by and doing nothing when only a occupying force could do what you wanted. So again, it's going to be constrained. The sort of interventions we're likely to be able to do over the next, say, decade are going to be... Uh, <coughs> constrained. And I think that uh, there are some other lessons to learn too from um, Libya. That after Srebrenica and after Rwanda, let alone what Pol Pot did, conveniently forgotten in Europe, but by far the biggest uh, post-war genocide, uh, it is right, in my view, in view of the Genocide Convention, and in view of the horror that uh, even to that day, and the embarrassment, and quite rightly the embarrassment, it should be wrung around the necks of the French, British, and American politicians. I mean, Srebrenica was an avoidable accident. And let it be per perfectly clear on record that that so-called action plan that was produced by the Americans and supported by the French and the uh, British and the Spanish and the Russians was a disgraceful piece of UNRI which was done in total defiance of all the professional advice of all the UN soldiers. If they said, if you want five safe havens, you've got to produce 33,000 troops. And after uh, a year, they didn't produce 6,000, let alone quality troops. So I think, and to his credit, uh, David Cameron's come close, pretty close to admitting that he just simply was not prepared to have a Srebrenica on his watch. And that was what was definitely going to happen in Benghazi. It was, you, you didn't have to do much more than just watch the news and listen to uh, Gaddafi's sons to realize that this was going to be a horrendous bloodbath. And it, you then come to the question, is, is it right that that sort of thing should drive foreign policy? I think it's inevitable. And I think he's right. And I think there has to be a moral dimension, ethical dimension, call it what you like, and I think that was one of the vital things. And we were just in time. And in fact, if the French hadn't moved that afternoon, early evening, I think we could have found the Gaddafi forces could have got entrenched in the outskirts of uh, Benghazi and it would have been hell's difficult to get out. So uh, we were literally just in time in our intervention in Libya. Now, what's most important? Human rights, democracy, 
There's nothing in the resolution, I may say, inevitably, uh, insisting that uh, Libya post uh, military activity has to be a democracy. I hope profoundly it is. But there's quite a lot about it needing to respect human rights. We aren't out of the danger zone. Uh, there are a lot of tensions in that uh, country. We haven't resolved some of the surrounding questions. I mean, we tried to intervene to prevent uh, a genocide in Darfur in 2008. We did, against the advice of the African Union, use the International Criminal Court. Bashir is uh, the first uh, operating head of state. Milosevic was only tried after he lost the presidency in uh, Serbia. Um, we did use the International Criminal Court in those resolutions over Libya. Quite a few people think unduly early, certainly the African Union and some in the, Af in the Arab League as well. Uh, it looks as if we're going to get away with it, and that somehow Gaddafi will uh, disappear, but we're not sure. The old, old argument that has always bedeviled all these peace negotiations, to what do we give the highest priority, absolute justice or reconciliation? Well, I've never made any secret of my view. Reconciliation comes before absolute justice when settling peace and war issues. And I think we've got to be very careful how we use these references to the International Criminal Court. It is still building up its reputation. It's important it succeeds, but we must not put too much onto it. And we must be very careful that the steps we take have the support of the countries surrounding it. And that reference to the International Criminal Court was a very dubious reference in my view. It was premature in terms, certainly, of the African Union. It strained the, uh, uh, the Arab states. And we should be careful about using this. Then on other things about uh, Gaddafi. Well, I have a history, of course, of this. Uh, one of the reasons, of course, I wanted to get rid of Saddam Hussein was I was uh, out of London. And I received an emergency message in 78 that a former Iraqi prime minister had been gunned down on the streets of London. I went back to the office, and the uh, Gaddafi, uh, uh, muddling them up, Saddam Hussein was not then president of Iraq. I didn't know much about him. On my desk was a, pre firstly, pretty concrete evidence already that uh, this chap Saddam Hussein was responsible for this gunning down, and then a list of his attributes, uh, which were all short, and the list of his uh, criminal record was extremely wrong. And from that moment on, I don't openly admit I've had him in my sights. And I've had Gaddafi in my sights for quite a long time, because in 78, 79, we were highly, we couldn't prove it, but we were highly suspicious of his links into the IRA. And he was a support for terrorism around the world. And I think the man is uh, being a hugely destabilizing influence. Now, was it wrong for uh, Bush and Blair to, and Clinton and Bush, because it went in the Clinton period as well, to try and persuade Gaddafi to give up nuclear weapons when we realized he was got a link with the Pakistani um, commercial peddler of nuclear weapons. I think it was right to do that. Not easy to do. I think uh, Tony Blair made a great mistake of going there himself. It's what a job you send your foreign secretary to go with. It, it, this whole idea of this personal diplomacy, a head of government has, there are things that heads of government don't do, and one of them is not kiss Gaddafi. Uh, and I think that uh, there are some serious errors of diplomacy were made during this period, which are still repercussing. But nevertheless, I think it was right to make this attempt. But Britain allowed its uh, trading interest and its financial interests in Libya to uh, run its foreign policy for the next four or five years with very dis serious and uh, disadvantageous results. But nevertheless, once it was clear from the results in Gaddafi's sons and others that we faced a challenge, the British responded, chiefs of staff somewhat uh, unwillingly, the politicians, in my view, and the coalition government admirably, and uh, Cameron with great clarity. And Sarkozy, I think, can give, if you have to award things, certainly high up in making a decision to stake the reputation of his presidency, which is at a low ebb, on this very risky venture. 
And I think Obama judged it absolutely right. Crucial to have those 200 cruise missiles coming in, taking out the ground-to-air missiles. Absolutely saved all the lives. We lost nobody. Um, could not have been done easily upon the air. Could have probably been done, but not easily. And I think he was right to start to make it clear that there are going to be interventions around the world which the United States are not going to automatically lead and that uh, regional powers must be expected to take the largest hold. I think it was a very good example of the strength and the value of NATO. The fact, the fact that this was an operation which was fundamentally done by three countries, and other four European countries did play an important role, but it was basically done by three, two European and one American country. But it used the infrastructure of the command and control procedures of NATO, built up over many long, painstaking years, which helped us in Kosovo, which helped us in Afghanistan, which are helping, helped us hugely in Libya. So even though it was an operation that did not command the support of all NATO members, Turkey obviously important, absent, uh, Germany, Poland, two very important countries, absent. Uh, though it split the European Union, as most foreign policy issues seem to be doing now for the last 20 years, um, nevertheless, Europe rallied afterwards, as Europe rallied over the 2003 invasion over Iraq, and we are and will be, I think, a major financial supporter in the rebuilding of Libya. Italy, I think, played, given its colonial role, and its extreme vulnerability, if something went wrong in Libya, played a, uh, a quite a strong hand, actually, and I think we should pay tribute to that. And the making available their airfields was a good example of solidarity. Overall, I think Libya is a very interesting development, therefore, for the future in terms of UN, in terms of NATO regional activity, and for the EU, I suppose there are pluses and minuses, but there are certainly lessons to be learned.